Good morning again. Good morning. The world is a better place after coffee. <laughs> so let us keep the good work. There will be more coffee today. Both lunch and coffee is planned. Okay, I'm, I'm Monica Pistero, and I'd like to tell you about the practice and the idea of, of solidarity. As I am a Polish person, I'd like to start with a little bit of history. We love that. Poles always do that. So, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> which some of us actually remember quite well, it was an era of solid modernity by the great sociologist in Bono. The textbooks that we used then in management, in organization studies, were all about structure and strategy. <coughs> that was the central light motive in those books, as I remember them, both from my Swedish and my Polish studies. So I remember them twice, and none of these times was a deliberate choice on my side. So you can say it was fate, or bad luck, depending on the perspective. Anyway, the solid modernity was an era which, as the name suggests, was characterized by solid structures. Which is very good because structures are effective. And thanks to structure, we can do, we human beings, do things together, we can act collectively. So we were extremely effective and we believed in the future. When I was growing up, this was a sort of a given. Things were getting better all the time. And when I grow up, the world will be a better place. People will be more equal. Men and women will be employed on equal <coughs> terms in organizations. That was a sort of a taken for granted hope that was more than a hope. It was a faith. And um, of course, there were a lot of things that were improving all the time, and we were we were taught in school about the history of social progress, of social movements, of, of liberation of different movements, of, of liberation of different countries, and we were sort of brought up with the assumption that if you want to change the world, you have to organize, of course. But there was a dark side to solid modernity, which we also know all too well, especially people interested in history and in sociology, but the totalitarian states, the, the terror of almost all powerful governments. That was a direct effect of those solid structures. It wasn't, it wasn't by chance, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't even a side effect. It was a direct effect. If structures were that effective, people used them for different reasons. Among other things, they used it for mass murder on a scale that was almost unprecedented in modern Europe. And that's 
among other, uh, other things, Sigmund Bauer's book, Modernity and the Holocaust, is dedicated precisely to that, how modernity managed, engineered, and organized mass murder. So a lot of people were quite happy to see this era go when it started to dissipate and disappear in, in the 1980s and then in the 1990s. People welcomed the new era, which, again, Sigmund Bauman labeled liquid modernity. When that time was greeted at business schools with honors because business schools were thriving in the 1990s, it wasn't about structure and strategy anymore. It wasn't about restructurization and anything of that kind. It was all about entrepreneurship. An initiative and invention and flexibility, these were the new sort of basic assumptions, the foundation of this new era, which immediately, from the very beginning, was showing some of its fundamental problems. Most of all, the loss of faith. It started gradually, and then it, the problems turned more and more difficult as we began to observe in our everyday lives such trends as instability, fragmentation, which among other authors, again, Sigmund Bauman is describing in his book, books how we lost our future because of the fragmentation. We, we started, we, we ceased to be able to plan, plan for the future. We ceased our ability to, to commit ourselves in both in, in official and in private relationships. So when I first started to work at the university, at Warsaw University in 1988, when I asked my students what they pl their plans for the future were, they sort of, they had a, a really tough quiz or question to answer because they were planning for the rest of their lives. This is what, what they were envisaging. They had to make a choice or they had to be very lucky because whatever they started doing after finishing their studies, they would be doing for the rest of their life. Last time I asked my students that question it was a few years ago at Durham University in the UK. Almost nobody answered. The few who did spoke in terms of three months, maybe. Maybe. I did not repeat that experiment. Then we lost the past. And the sociologist Richard Sennett describes that very well in the corrosion of character, how we stopped being able to relate back to past things to past events. No wonder that lies are thriving in the climate because and mismanagement because if I cannot relate to something that has been, I'm not accountable. Of course not. I can say anything. I can claim anything. And <clears throat> by now, I have to claim anything because otherwise nobody would be interested in talking to me. So we, we really lost our ability to think in terms of continuity, and this is a direct consequence of the dogma of flexibility. When I was in high school, by flexibility you meant an ability of something to change its shape and get back to its original shape. Nowadays, the word has changed its meaning. It doesn't mean that anymore. It means to change shape and change shape and change shape ad infinitum forever because there is no original state. There is nothing to get back to. And finally, we've done away with mystery. And we've started doing that during solid modernity already because we believe that science would answer all the questions. But now, 
we have to account for everything. We have to speak the language of numbers in order to be taken seriously, in order, in order to be seen as an adult member of society. And recently, that's not enough. Now we have to use the language of finance to talk about personal relationships, to talk about our dreams. Again, when I was in high school, talking about personal relationships in terms of finance, well, I, I, I never, I never came across anything like that. If, and if I did, it would have meant that there was something seriously wrong with that person. So we've done it. We've really done it now. <coughs> And what comes next? Well, what is already happening is this. And again, Sigmund Bauman, who has borrowed this metaphor from Antonio Gramsci, calls this time, times like these, the interregnum. It's of course a metaphor. It means a time in between kings, but we are not waiting for King Arthur. Not exactly, not in that way. It's a time span of unknown length, stretching between a system that used to work and a new one that will be working again. The problem is we don't know what it is. We don't know what it will be. We have no idea. We cannot even imagine it. We're standing in no man's land, in between, in the gap. The gap is horrendous. It's so bad so bad that we refuse to see it for what it is. We need some filters, we need some blockers in order to be able to survive because as psychologists and even management theorists such as Carl White claim that the human being is a sense-making creature. Without sense and without air, we cannot survive. Therefore, we have to invent a present. We have to go back to a, a in Sigmund Bauman's words, to a, a past that never has been a retrotopia kind of uh, things that we believe or we dream of. The past was like, but it never has been like that, really. Or we have to limit our vision to see only our personal goals and aims and. There is no space for reflection because, not just because we are unable to engage in it or because we don't know the future, but also because it is impossible. It's impossible to live in times that make, that make no sense. So, uh, can you hear me back, back there? I can use the microphone if you like, not this one. I don't like these Dalek things, but okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, what what is happening now around us if we dare to take a look? Or when reality falls itself upon us, when we see a glimpse of what surrounds us. We see this destruction. Liquid modernity has been going on for a long time. Structures have really been fragmented. They don't work anymore. And if structures don't work, if institutions don't work, we are not able to collaborate. We cannot do things together. The, our effort is wasted. We have to force ourselves to do things together. We have to be forced, terrorized by despots, by psychopaths, by rules, by endless bureaucratic systems. Because there is no real way of relating to each other, no structural way of solving our problems, which are enormous, are gigantic, and we cannot even start to begin dealing with them. The structures are coming apart. It's a process of destruction. And it really looks like it. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. What comes up is the debris. And it flies around and it looks atrocious. It looks 
Tom Friend has said we are terrified even more, even more, by every day, things that happen all around us, things that cease working, the institutions that we used to trust, and which turn out to be, at best, impotent, at worst, violent and odious. Yes, that's what happens when things fall apart. The apocalypse means destruction, but it also means revelation. That's where the etymology of the words comes from. And it also happens to be, so Lilith Barb's not here, the title of my new book, forthcoming in December, after the apocalypse. The revelation means that when these things fall apart, the structures and the institution that used to fill our social space, things are revealed that were invisible until now because there were things standing there, these institutions and structures, and now we can see the ground if we're not obstructed by the debris falling in our eyes. Then we can see the foundations of these institutions. And quite often it is violence and raw power. But sometimes it is what it was supposed to be when they were originally founded. Shared values. And we really need to retrieve them. We really need to start looking for them. And in my book, I claim we should start looking for them in the margins because that's where the new things tend to come from, not in the center, it doesn't fall anyway, but in the margins. And one of these values, or two important values that I hope we can retrieve and find. Among all these horrendous things, we have to be very courageous to start this quest. But it's there. It's solidarity and the common good. There are more of them, of course, but these two I would like to dedicate the rest of my talk to. As for solidarity, well, it's really a state of grace. And it, it's very difficult to organize it. It's impossible to manage it. Grace comes, grace goes. It stays somewhere. It stays with us. It's necessary to be able to begin trusting each other again, to start building up the other central value, the common good. Without solidarity, we will get nowhere. I do remember these times. I was living in Sweden at the time, but I visited Poland, it was 1980, and I, I remember the atmosphere, I remember the people. My, my, my grandfather was a worker, and there were people from the working class meeting in our home in the evening, drinking tea from glasses, you know, that, that very dark substance, and smoking endless cigarettes. So it, it was quite foggy in the room, and they were talking and talking and talking. There's power in solidarity, but it cannot be managed. Common good can be managed. So at least that, we can have a sort of a program, a constructive program to bring about and to believe in once again. And the common good, to summarize the idea very briefly, is about shared ownership, shared responsibility, companionship. It's not the same thing as public good. Public good belongs to the public, which is quite uh, uh, abstract. And, and there are some people who claim that the public belongs to nobody or to everybody, same thing. But the, the 
common good belongs to the community, members of the community, and the community is responsible for it, and it exists really in real physical space. Well, most of us have come across this idea, I guess. It, it, it works as a kind of a, in a World Bank paper from 1989, calls it even a discussion paradigm. It's very well known and widely cited. One of the most cited articles ever uh, offered by the biologist Garrett Hardin, who published in 1968. Uh, it's the titled The Tragedy of the Commons. It introduces the idea that uh, what is common, what belongs to a community, becomes eroded and becomes destroyed by the loss of responsibility. And it's used as an argument that only private property is rational. And he cites an example from the 19th century England where there were common pastures known as the commons and shepherds, rational shepherds, added sheep to their flocks that grazed at these common grounds and destroyed them. So that was the rational way of approaching the common good, to try to make the most of it, to profit most from it. And uh, if you didn't do that, you, you were losing uh, out of the competition. But in the end, this common ground didn't fare well. It became eroded and destroyed by misuse. So that's basically the argument. And it's, it's rarely repeated in these many words. It's usually just cited as a, as a sort of discussion paradigm supporting the thesis that private is all, always more rational. Problem is, this is a strong thesis based on a very special case, on evidence that is anecdotal, and it has been refuted many times by numerous authors who actually took a good look at the argument, how it was running, and discussed with it, and dealt with it quite successfully. So Bromley and Cernia, also in 1989, say that the Hobden metaphor is not only socially and culturally simplistic, it's also historically false. So it doesn't prove much. Furthermore, in this reasoning, which is really interesting because this one concerns us big time, is the issue of management. The hardened metaphor <coughs> disregards completely from the issue of management, which is very, very central, central idea and the practice of the common good. So in, a, in an article that is forthcoming, it's, it's maybe even being published as we speak, which we authored together with a colleague from Warsaw, Alexander Grostowski. We reconsider the whole idea and we take a good look at the line of argumentation and we say that the, the biggest yes things become mismanaged. Is it really such a surprise? Without proper management, without management that is adequate for a given situation or organization, things also tend to become mismanaged. So you need to use a, a well-adapted management technique method or idea in order to take care of the common good in the way that it should be taken care of. The, 
management style or a management idea, which is proper for the common good, should be aligned to the central value of the common good. Oops. It sounds trivial, and of course it is trivial. It, it, it's, a, it, it's really a surprise that it's not treated as something very, very basic, which means that the, the management system needs to be based on risk relationships, community relationships, and on trust. And in order to manage the common good, you need to be able to trust that the other partners, the other side, have goodwill. You, you need to be able to trust in the partner's goodwill. And you need to have solid, stable relationships. These two things are indispensable, and the other things can be constructed upon these foundations. The problem with the Hagen argument, again, is that it says nothing about that, and the special case that it takes up come from, comes from 19th century England, which was a, a situation when capitalism was doing its first steps into a system that was based on the common, common good. It used to work before, but it ceased working now because the system was changing. And yes, shepherds were behaving in an egoistic way because the pastures are being privatized. So foreseeing that or adapting to the dynamics, they were behaving selfishly. That was the new rationality, and it wasn't adapted to the common good. And if you have a situation like this, something is being privatized and people cease caring about the common, what it is called is racket economics. You grab whatever there is to grab and capitalism and not the tragedy of the commons. Instead, let us perhaps consider something else. Let us consider the Roman. Let us perhaps consider something else. Let us consider the Romans of the Kites. The Kites. The, uh, uh, the economist Eleanor Ostrom, who was awarded the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize, studied many institutions based on the idea of the idea of she says she said that this actually works this is not a utopian ideal but it is a practice that is working in many situations on the conditions that the communities are able to establish their own rules and manage their own resources and they must be able to include tradition structures and cultural norms into their system of management in order to get this viable. And another interesting feature about the, the management of the common good is that it is rooted in community values. So you, have, you need to have strong community values. But thanks to this, you don't need either market forces or central planning. These two institutions are not in accordance with the institution of the common good. The common good is based on a different structural logic and institutional logic, but it needs to be followed. It, it needs, you need to be faithful to the foundations, the rules, and the values in order to get it actually working. So there are a few examples of this, not just on your classroom, but you have you have the, the urban space, which is being studied by many different researchers, including 
economists such as Zofia Wapniewska and urban uh, architects such as Krzysztof Nawratek. And they give good and viable examples of how the idea of a common good can be used in, in local budget planning or in city planning, in, in urban planning, where it's not just a leading star, but actually a kind of a practice that determines other practices. Another area where, where the idea of the common good actually works and is being <coughs> practiced is something that I will present based on my own research, an ongoing study which I began seven years ago of something called alternative organizations. The problem with this label, alternative organizations, is that, as you can see in the remarks and public, it's, it's really everything. It's everything except the center. If we don't look into the center, which happens to be exactly what all the management textbooks are about, except for ours, of course. The humanistic network, management network does not make this mistake. But almost all the other management textbooks and business school programs and modules and so on are focusing on the, the center, the corporate management case. And everything else is pushed out into the margins. And most people don't even know that it exists. I mean, a lot of students don't, don't have it as part of their curriculum. And as I said, it's everything. It's, it's the, the public sector organizations, very often cooperatives, informal organizations, religious organizations, uh, activist organizations, what have you. But now it's informal organizations, religious organizations, uh, activist organizations, what have you. But now, of course, not studying all of that. I'm studying uh, self-managed organizations <coughs> belonging to different forms, organizational forms. But nowadays, it's mainly cooperatives. I, I started out by studying different including some private and family owned, but because they they were running into some problems, I focused on the cooperatives. So now it's the ones I, I am continuing my research on have that structure. And they're, they are doing different things. They are uh, selling food. They are running a kindergarten. They are, there, there is a media media organization, I'm running a, uh, a magazine, uh, an art and technology organization, and so on. So they, they, they do different things, but they are very small. My organizations are not very big. They have a few important things in common, uh, which fits very, very well with the idea of the common good. Um, they look a bit like a mixture of private-like and public-like. They don't really fit into the categories from other textbooks, the sociology textbooks. They, uh, the, they talk a lot, a lot about value, these people engaging in these organizations, different values, things that are important to them. They are really extremely serious about that, very, very earnest. They work for the many and not just for, for the few, and they, but they feel a lot of people engaging in these organizations, they feel that they would need a lot of support in order to develop. They don't get the support, and therefore they don't develop. That's the story that I hear over and over again. They remain small, but at some point in the future, so many of my interviewees claim at some point in the future maybe they will get more support and then they will become the mainstream which is possible but we cannot know for sure until it happens and 
to give a few examples of the central values and central rules that are important for these organizations, supported by some quotations from <coughs> interviews. Uh, these are, of course, uh, pseudonyms. I right? don't use actual names in the writing of research. <coughs> so, first of all, it is sociology. These organizations make space for sociology, for people being together, caring for each other and caring about each other. And then this is, I hear, keep hearing about it over and over again in interviews, but also in private conversations. It's a, a central theme throughout many seven years, it's something I hear every day if I'm, I'm in the field. Uh, but I think this quote is especially representative, and it, it's really, it's really a, a major one, I think. I just feel like I don't want to do anything alone ever again. The other important thing, which I, I think is quite central here, is that the people engaging in organizing want to do something good for themselves and for others. So they need to have a good that is greater than themselves. They are not interested in pursuing egoistical goals, and they need to trust the other person to do the same thing for them. That there is a concern, that's why they are so earnest. They are really very, very earnest. No irony in these organizations. Another thing that is central here is, is democracy, and it's a radical kind of democracy. So they really negotiate everything. It takes an eternity. It takes forever to make decisions, really. And sometimes, it's just one of the organizations. It can go completely wrong. When the conflict split an organization in two, and they are, the conflict split an organization in two, and they are not speaking to each other. For the second year, they are not speaking to each other. They, they cannot run their organization, but they are not speaking to each other. So. And heaven knows what will come out of this one. But usually, <coughs> they are able to come to, if not a compromise, then at least an agreement, something that will enable them to finally make a decision and to go on. And they have just different solutions because sometimes you have to act fast. For example, the media organization, they are running a magazine, they need to make fast decisions. So they trust, actually they do trust the director to make these decisions, but they control him. They all the time observe what he's doing so that he does not betray their trust. Betrayal is a very, very dark thing. It kills everything. The next thing is important thing is how how crucial it is to build these relationships so that people can start trusting each other. That the building process takes time. So it's not an organization that you can enter and then leave. You, when you, you are there, you stay there, you quarrel with all these people, and we, you discuss with them, but you stay put. And something comes out of it. And the longer you are there, the more enlightening it gets. The easier it gets to manage and organize in this way. <coughs> and then, of course, something that we have been talking about today already a lot is responsibility. This is also quite central in all the organizations I, I am studying. To take responsibility, to be able to actually take responsibility for what one is doing, for one's workplace, for one's work effects, for one's relationships, for one's commitments into the future. Yes, these organizers do plan. And they do sometimes plan long term. And I've been recently attending a meeting at one of my British organizations, the art technological one, and they were planning in five years' terms, which is 
it's, it's really unbelievable these days, especially as they cannot even foresee how they will be financed. The grants they receive are marginal. They, are, they do not even cover their costs, but still they have a five year working plan. But that is not all. The study of small organizations is one thing, but there are also big organizations which at least have the potential of working as the common good. One of them is this here, the university, the Yagelon University. It's huge, and we do believe it is our common good. It's greater than any of us. And we feel that we have something in common with a generation of people who have been participating in it before. And we have responsibility for the people who will come after us. But there are other examples, such as the enterprise that we describe in our paper to be published together with Alexander Kostovsky. We call this enterprise so Pitex is a student. And again, it's, it's a, it comes from the sort of a play on a fictional fictional uh, poem, uh, epic poem, but important in Polish culture. It symbolizes the utopia, the Arcadia, of something that was good and that became lost. Because this is exactly what happened with Sofitex. It used to be, it wasn't easy to run an enterprise as common good under state communism before 989. But sometimes you could just about manage to do it. And this, this organization had its, had its glimpses of it in the past. Maybe not in the Stalinist 50s, but later on in the 70s, they were able to do something that they were very proud of in the past. That a sense of belonging, a sense of history, a sense of responsibility. And then when the New Times came in 1989, they were all very happy because now they could really engage in management for the common good. So they hired consultants, action research consultants, who came not in order to tell them what to do, but they came to help them to learn and to develop together. And were well, learning together with them. And they, because what they wanted to do was to develop a, a democratic management system, participative, where everybody in the company had a voice and could participate in, 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 in crafting the strategy. And there was a plan of stock employee ownership, and there was a long term development plan for how to democratize the company. Everybody was very happy for these plans. People were really happy to forfeit their benefits because they were going profitably, they were going really well, in order to invest this money and to see a common, brighter future that someone told them. So it was, to them, it was our company. The Alexander Kostovsky, who was there, who was one of the main action researchers in this case study, he heard this expression all the time, our company. We, investor, financial investor, management was laid off, some people left by themselves, the whole plan was abolished and everything turned out very differently from what these plans assumed. However, it was possible. It was possible, it did work, they went with profit, they had plans, and even if it didn't work out for them in that moment of time, that unfortunate moment of time. We can still learn from this case, and we can use it at some better occasion in the future, which we conclude with Alexander Kostowski that this knowledge is common good, and we are free to use it. Both we academics and we consultants, and hopefully also we managers. So to begin the concluding part 
slowly. Um, it all boils down, well, I, I know, I know everybody has their limitations and we see fragments of the world. And I, I really do know that the, there's much more to the world than organization and management, believe me. But organization and management are important. I'm very convinced of it because this is the level where we actually still can, even in the interregnum, where we still have some agency and we still can do something and we sort of know what to do. We have, we have an idea because we can find organizations in the present which are using good practices, we can learn from them, or in the past and learn from what used to work in the past, adapted to the present and the future. So, yes, business, why not? But what for? We need to ask ourselves the question. And if community, if business based on the common good, then who and for whom? What community? And yes, reclaim, reclaim the causes. There are four of them, not one. There are four of them. For many decades, we had a sort of a fixation on this one, on the last one, of efficiency. If something is efficient, then it, you have to do it. It's cause enough, it's reason enough. And if it's not efficient enough, then you do not do it. But there are other reasons. There are other causes which we need to take a good look at before we start building the new structures. <coughs> What do we use? <coughs> what matter? What material? Human work. What is human work? It is a material. How do we use it? The form or shape. What is the shape? What do we want to do together? What do we want to achieve? The fine way. There needs to be a vision. Why not the five-year plan? It can be wild, it can be crazy, but we need to have it. It can be a utopia. Why not? Better to have a utopia than to have chaos. And efficiency, why not? It's also a good cause, but it's one of <coughs> many. Not the sole one, not unique. Margins. You can already see things happening there. That's, that's why I insist, keep on insisting that the margins are a very good place to be. As one of my great friends and teachers and mentors, Professor Heather Huff used to say, the margins is the place to be because that's where the good things of the future come from. And perhaps this is one of them, the spectre of communism. The commons, the things that we care for more than of our own selfish interest, that we can share and we can try to build up together with other people. Maybe, maybe, in the margins. Well, the problem is not just the lack of a system, a working system. It's not just about the lack of structure. It is also, to be quite honest, what has been already addressed in, in the keynote call, the abundance. We do not know what to do with it. We do not know what to do with it. We cannot handle the abundance. We have no tools to address complexity. And we, the old timers, with those old textbooks about structure and strategy, who used to learn about the systems approach in management theory, we learned that there is nothing as dangerous as simple solutions to complex problems. So we are not looking for simple solutions, not at all. We are not looking for the beautiful, the, the shapely, the attractive solutions. No, we're looking for the ugly solutions, the, the solutions with a lot of forms on them with the, the bad shapes, the strange ones, the stranger the better, we need 
complex solutions from complex problems. And the common good is a complex solution. It's very complicated. It's not simple at all. It's not lean and mean. It's complex and kind. So, finally, there are, I think, three tentative, I wouldn't say rules, no, wrong word, three pieces of advice based on all the things I know about the common good in urban space and alternative organizations and in big organizations that we perhaps could consider for management of the common good complex management of the complex common good. First of all, shared ownership, real ownership, cooperative, employee shareholdership, employee participation schemes. Without that, nothing else will follow. I am very much convinced of it. We need to have some peace, some real peace of the ownership structure in order to make it real and not make it another consultancy magical affair. Shared responsibility, yes, of course. We need to be able to be responsible for the whole, not just for our own interests and aims, not, not negotiate so much as share visions, realistic or not. Something that will bring us together and make ourselves, as we, responsible for this bigger entity. And companionship, yes, it's important for people. People are social beings. We need each other. We want to be able to engage in relationships. We tend to like each other. If we only get the chance, well, the chance must present itself. And if you have an idea of what we are talking about, you are correct. <laughs> but here we are. And we can already start doing all those good things. Thank you very much.